uh, something that every young professional is seeking an answer to. Uh, and to address this, we have Mr. Ronnie Struwala. I missed us to share his views and insight. Uh, Mr. Struwala is a first generation Indian entrepreneur and philanthropist. He has been named on Esquire's list of the 75 most influential people of the 21st century and ranked 78 among the 100 most influential people in the world on the Time 100, compiled by the Time magazine in 2009. He was also listed amongst 25 Asia's most powerful people by a Fortune magazine entitled The Jack One of India by Newsweek. Mr. Screwala, pioneer at cable television, built a media and entertainment conglomerate that partnered with some of the world's top media houses. And later, he divested the company to Disney for an enterprise value of 1.4 uh, billion US dollars. Mr. Screwala and his wife run a non profit, the Swadesh Foundation where they work with a million people in rural India, empower them and try to move them out of poverty. <clears throat> Sorry. He has also co-founded Upgrad, which is into online education in the higher education and specialization sector, built a sports company spanning football, esports, and kabaddi, re-entered the media content space to build a creative content company in movies and digital content, and authored a book titled Dream With Your Eyes Open. Sir, it's a complete pleasure to have you, and thank you once again for taking our time to address no, Thank us. you. Happy to be here and hope uh, we have a nice interactive session. I'm sure. And at this moment, I will introduce Ms. Yashodra Bajoria, our National Branding Chair, to moderate the session and take it forward. Lovely. Before I hand it over to Yashodra, I will request all the participants to please keep the microphone on mute and camera off to have a better bandwidth. And if they have any questions, do type it in the chat box during the last 15 minutes of Q&A. Thank you so much. Over to you, Yashodra. Thank you, Harsh, and uh, welcome, Mr. Skruvala, and thank you for taking this time out to spend and share some of your insights uh, with all of our members here at Young Indians. Uh, diving right into this interaction, uh, uh, sir, I would like to kind of take you back to a time uh, when you probably engaged in reading scripts before choosing the movie that you wanted to produce. So allow me to enunciate a scenario uh, for you, which could possibly reflect the future of work and life that would look like in a post-COVID-19 situation. I hope I'm audible to you, sir. Absolutely, go ahead. So sir, imagine a scenario where you walk into your office through a contactless pathway, fitted with motion sensors and facial recognition software, integrated with your mobile phone, allowing you to open your doors without touching anything. There will be a smart lift, with fewer people to carry you to your floor where your office is based out of. The seating now in your office, sir, will look very sparse. The chairs neatly positioned, maintaining their social distancing. It's not only the workplace that looks emptier for you, but it's even your washrooms that will seem less busy. Some of the changes will not even be visible to you with your naked eye. There will be antimicrobial properties woven into fabrics and materials. Ventilation systems would be amped up in your office. And in some cases, even UV lights would go up in the night just for some deep cleaning. Processes and procedures for checking the health of employees would be integrated into schedules now. Lunches and conferences will be different and pushed virtually. Mr. Skruvala, is this a scene from a sci-fi movie or is this what the workplace will look like in the future? Your comments. No, I don't think this is a sci-fi movie. Um, I think a sci-fi movie will need with all due respect, a lot more imagination right. because now this is already the constant. So we have to get it, to get for it to be sci-fi. It'll have to be even much more imaginative. And, um, you know, I mean, all I can say is in the last seven weeks of us reviewing our working at Upgrad at Aswadeh Foundation and very much else, I think almost three out of our seven main offices, we're almost, uh, we're almost giving up those offices. Okay. Because right. we realized that um, there's efficiency and look, you know, I just want to say work from home is not a terminology. I think in India, the challenge for work for home is that for many of us, um, we don't have a phenomenal work for home environment. Okay, we live in a joint family, the flat may be less. So, and it's not like everyone is looking forward to for the rest of their lives, getting up and walking only into the living room and opening up their things. Sometimes it's very frustrating to negotiate traffic and the risk and hazards of that. But at the same time, I'm not sure work for home habit is, is as, as human beings, we're stuck to that. But there's a sense of efficiency on it. Right. So how do we use technology to actually bring what has now been pushed onto us and has forced us to open our minds when it's actually staring in front of us and we didn't and right. go forward? So I think that's really um, the workplace of tomorrow. I wouldn't even call it the office of tomorrow. The workplace of tomorrow is exactly what we're having here right now. This is a workplace. 
So I think those will, in fact, only technologically advance. Right. Because today, I think we're all using what was already there and available, but we couldn't see it. Only 10 million people logged on to Zoom now. 200 million people do that. X number on Skype now, many more. So I think that's where it will go. Um, the critical element that I think we all need to understand in this sci-fi setup or any setup is that communication is a very important part of getting work done. It's a very important part of interpersonal relationships, sure. inspiring people and getting work done. So you can use whatever technology you want to, but we need to retain leadership qualities and communication skills. And leadership qualities working in a, in a technology background or in a different unique work from home place will be different. And lastly, all I would say is, all of this is being painted as the next 12, 18, 24 months. Right. And the point is, it can always go back after that because I don't think forever and ever we're going to live in this situation where we'll have to have glass partitions of social distancing. But we may need to do that for 12 months. We may need to do it for 24 months. The question is, that's a deep enough change in learning experience for us to not go back to what we were doing and a new normal will come about. Right, right. It's interesting that you speak about uh, human capital strategies. Uh, just to kind of uh, also uh, talk to you a little bit about a program that's run by Amazon in the US. Uh, the Amazon runs a program for its associates at its fulfillment centers called the Pay to Quit program, where an employee is allowed to leave Amazon with a condition that he will never work for Amazon again. And for doing so, he gets paid uh, up to $5,000. With human capital strategies and communication and interpersonal skills that you touched upon right now being developed by burning the midnight oil, what would you say are the pillars of building a great workplace then in this new scenario? Workplace is about people at the end of the day. It's not about having the table tennis and the dartboards. Yeah. It's not about having the open space and recreation. Those are all nice for magazines and for getting some awards here and there. But the real workplace is culture of an organization. I think today in the 21st century, people need to look at culture, not more about the environment I'm in or the less stress and tension I'm in. It's about, am I growing yeah. as an individual and am I learning as an individual? And I think those are going to be the important criteria because I think the best way you can be satisfied is if you're learning and you're growing. Because if you're not, believe me, no sense of any environment or great workplace is going to be able to do that. So I think the workplaces of tomorrow are the places where people will, more and more people will feel this is a place in which I learned the most. I think if I can pride myself with the number of people that work with us in our media company for the 15 years and are now doing phenomenally well as entrepreneurs, CEOs of various companies. Right. For me, uh, the greatest context is when they come back and say, look, we had the roughest time when we worked with you, but we learned the most. Wow, that's, uh, I mean, that is sort of uh, pretty encouraging because it's very difficult uh, to get bosses who kind of leave that impression on you as you move forward. And you have been quite... At that time, it is not the best impression. But in <laughs> retrospect, it works out to be the best impression. Okay. I've also been told at that time, it may not be the best impression. Oh, okay, okay, okay. Thank you for yeah, that. But in a positive manner, I think it's fine. Okay, great. Thank you for that caveat. Also, speaking about one of the other mega trends that's kind of taking over the world is before the whole COVID-19 situation, of course, played out, and even more so now, in fact, uh, was this entire gig economy. Uh, more and more large corporates are dealing with freelancers and consultants than ever before. Do you think this is a trend that is here to stay and perhaps grow? And how is this nature going to change, uh, you know, how we perceive work now going forward? So my, my personal view is, in an arbitrage economy like we sometimes in, we're, we're a cost, cost plus economy, whether it's BPOs and sales centers or whether it's great large service or even IT, right. the economy has got, has got a good place for it because then you can come in and go out and people want freelance people and you don't mind. So there's, a, and there's an entire employment faculty that wants people on a temporary basis and there's an entire workforce that wants to work on a temporary basis. Right. I think tomorrow as the world not shrinks, but grows into a different place, and this is not just present COVID and post COVID, but it's also when data, machine learning, artificial intelligence, and all the necessary other new technologies come in, the top part of the organization is really where the excellence is gonna come in. So the question is, you may want to have a will to be a freelancer, and you may want to be part of the gig economy as a, as a, as a working professional, but, 
there could be a possibility that you may therefore be left out of it because the need or requirement may not be there. And second, your best skills may not be used the most because then you're the dispensable commodity. And the third, I just, I just want to put down for people who are very interested that I want to freelance and I want to take time off. If you're learning and growing, it's fine. But if you're coming in and out of an organization and therefore your learning curve is not as sharp as people who are part of an organization, that's also something to introspect on. It's really interesting that uh, you were kind of speaking about certain things that we in any case had uh, thought of asking you. And especially when you kind of touched upon things like, uh, you know, the new work pace, uh, which is going to be, of course, flooded with accelerated connectivity. You're going to have technologies like augmented reality, AI, robots, uh, taking over the regular office, so to say. Uh, the net effect, as you rightly said, some will be, some will benefit and there will be some who will, uh, unfortunately, also suffer. Quoting from the movie Swadesh that was made under your banner, is it going to still be the case of Apni Chokhat Ka Diya giving light to neighbor's house? How well is India's workforce poised to take on this challenge? Are we looking at a brain drain again, all over again? Um, well, I'd like to just answer that with another quote from the same movie. But first, I'd like to say, I don't think many of these elements of artificial intelligence, machine learning that are going to take over. I would be cautious about using the word take over myself because of the simple reason that I think it's not. It will augment, it may slightly replace, but it will not take over. Right. And I think one of the lines that I think for this generation today from Swadesh is when uh, Shah Rukh Khan's boss, the NASA head, tells him, all right, if that's what you decided to do, go light your bulb. And I think today the inspiration that everyone needs to figure out is what is your bulb? And how are you going to light your bulb? That's quite powerful, actually. That's really, really relevant. I, I, when I actually, when I was doing a little bit of R&D and, you know, figuring out what to ask you, it almost feels like all the movies that you've produced, uh, they all have such powerful dialogues. And so many of that is so relevant today, in today's time. Uh, it's, it's, pretty, it's pretty amazing. Taking you through this journey of our Q&A, uh, Mr. Skruwala, and also now as this, uh, the, the, I mean, the role of a co-founder that you are of Upgrad, uh, the global lingo now has changed. You know, it's awash with acronyms like WFH, PPE, HCQ, SARS-CoV-2. The list is endless, you know. The language of society and business has undergone a change. But, but I think social media has also contributed towards you getting to these acronyms uh, yeah. from a from point of view because you know that's you want to com communicate more and more briefly but yeah go ahead sure so if you were to start a platform like upgrad in this changed environment would you reimagine it and if yes what would you change about it my simple answer is no because actually okay. when we thought about it four years before we already knew we were pioneering so when you're pioneering you need to be very clear you're not before your time i see i think we could have been before our time so to be honest I think we did exact, we were to do exactly the same thing. What I think now is what would have taken us another four years to do, we'll do in one and a half years. But the first four years of what we did, we needed to cement and form a great learning experience. The key in upgrade and the differentiator from many other short courses that people take is the learning experience. Now, education is not about sitting. And I, I think everyone is feeling, oh, all my learning has gone online. No, it hasn't. Only your classes have gone online. That means the professor now is sitting in front of a camera and he's talking to you. That's not the final element of learning. If you really want to go online learning, it's an entire context of an entire learning experience with counselors, with many other people, with grading systems, with feedback. That is not that prevalent in the present platform where everyone feels, oh, I just went online and I've got to sit in front of a computer. It's going to be much more than that. Right. So I think we invested in taking anonymity out of online. And what do I mean by that? I meant like when you take an online course, you feel lonely because of the simple reason that you can easily be a dropout and nobody would know. Sure. In college, you're not a dropout because there's social pressure. Many people may want to drop out, but they can't because it's visible. On an online course, if you just don't log on the next day, you're a dropout, but nobody next necessarily needs to know. So how do we bring about the same environment? So I think what we did in the first three years, we would do pretty much the same thing again. I think our communication and messaging might be slightly different, but I do believe what, as I said, what we would have otherwise done in the next four years, I think we'll do in the next one and a half. Right. Okay. That's uh, uh, 
that's a really big thumbs up to the whole upgrad platform considering uh, a lot of businesses are kind of reviewing what they have kind of done and uh, kind of undergoing that kind of going back on the drawing board so to say uh, taking you back uh, a little bit on uh, i mean sticking with upgrad but just like giving you a little bit of a perspective the last time a non indian american didn't win the national spelling bee competition held in the us was 12 years ago this year like other marquee sporting events the scripps national spelling bee competition has also been called off and it's been the first time since world war 2 that this has happened and as a quick remedy two young indian american siblings will be holding the same competition virtually now re do remember these are school students so while upgrad offers professional skill training and higher level education what is your sense of the future of ed the education for school students in india and what can they do to play catch up to their global counterparts or do you think that they are ahead of their com uh, of their global counterparts and you know hence they are kind of doing so well even in countries like the us the yeah, schooling system here in india is not bad the private schooling system is actually better than the american private schooling system if you ask anyone if if you've got a, a couple and and if their kid comes back to india from the sixth standard in in the us the probability is they'll have to go back to the fourth standard in india and that's pretty much one benchmark now that doesn't mean give us a clean sheet because when we get to really the other sustained schools overall the global curriculum context is a bit jaded I think there are enough slides and presentations across where, you know, everyone shown cars hundred years before cars hundred, and you've seen all of that. You know, yeah. every single place hundred years before hundred, and then a classroom hundred years before, same hundred years today. So I think what 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 online education allows and does is that it broadens the scope because faculty is about fifty percent of the success of most learning. Right? You remember most? What do you most remember about your school days outside of forming the most deepest friendships? is your teachers and how they taught you and they how they left an impression on you and if you can get the best of that faculty online it gives you an ability to do that the second is that while you have a classroom and a blackboard and a chalk and a duster online allows you to be actually ar and vr like artificial intelligence in many forms and and virtual reality and artificial reality in many aspects because in that environment of me as a teacher i can have 14 pop ups pretty much like i would do in a science fiction movie by just pressing a screen and it pops up the exact illustration and then when i want to tell you a story or an anecdote for you to completely remember the lesson i can just press a video and in one minute that story would hold on more and uh, to your mind than anything else so i think that's really where it goes as right. far as schooling is concerned but i think the model will be omni right. and what i mean by omni is i think everyone understand that because of the e-commerce now today is it's going to be a, a hybrid of online and offline and that is really the future right right that's interesting also kind of understanding that how the governments and the state schools are going to kind of adopt to this hybrid model would also be an interesting uh, um, i mean evolution to uh, see because a lot of the schooling that we talk about uh, the state has a massive role to play in it and i belong to delhi and we know that how when the st uh, state governments do get involved it can ha it does have the power to change a lot what would you uh, advise to uh, i mean what would your advice to state governments for schools i think education? everyone has to be a lot more open minded and understand that this is what is needed i think uh, for too much time we paid too little in, uh, attention to the fact of let's create a school let's create the infrastructure people should go to school there's a discipline to it which there should be but i think the element of being able to use the best of both worlds is now coming in front of you right. it's going to require a lot of open minds it's going to require open minds of principals government uh, education institutions teachers the way we learn the way we teach the level of confidence of everybody because sometimes you feel a little impersonal sitting like where you are sitting and having a question versus if you know the response not right. everyone can handle something i don't know today of the hundreds of participants that are on here right now say for example what are they thinking um you know and what, what how are they responding but when i'm in a live classroom i get that sense i get the chemistry i get the vibe i get the energy so it's a little bit like theater it's a little bit like everything else you know if you want to perform like shakespeare or anywhere else near a thousand people in the auditorium or you just perform in an empty auditorium because somebody's recording it it requires a very different exposure and i think that's going to be a slow process for everyone to accept but i think the time has come to make that change and if a if a sort of a global pandemic is bringing everyone a little bit closer to that by necessity i think right now my only concern is people will look at it as a necessity and when the necessity is over let's go back to normal 
and that'll be a shame and that'll be a waste. Right. Uh, it's interesting that you speak about Shakespeare and we will reserve the question on your role as Othello for the future uh, in the, in, in, uh, just after a few more questions. Uh, just wanted to speak... Othello. Oh, you mean when I played... Yeah, I did Taming of the Shrew also and I did Othello. I bet it's, Taming of the Shrew was in, it was, in, it was in school actually. I, I believe so. I believe so. We will ask you to uh, tell us a little bit about that experience in just a okay. bit. Uh, India is the number one consumer of data today, Mr. Skruvala. However, bandwidth is still a hurdle. With the advent of 5G being a distant dream, today only about 3% of internet users in the country have wired broadband. What hurdles do you think poor quality internet connectivity can create for proper execution and success of online education programs? And I'm not speaking about the urban population here. Necessarily. It's not easy to do this on mobile and we are learning, but I think the smartphone is getting a little larger. It's getting much more well-priced. And I, therefore that 3% jumps up if you start looking at mobile as also being a good um, gadget for you to be able to learn on. It's not the best process, but it's a good way to start. Right. Um, if we want to do online and use it in the maximum way we can, we do need for it to be um, video and audio. Uh, but I think that's changing. If it was two years back and we were looking at this, we might think it might be 10 years away. But I think today we're about two years away again on this. So there's a phenomenal level of acceleration. And I think on a decent sized mobile phone, a lot of people can actually get more excited. If I wanted to, uh, instead of having a physical library in a school in rural India, if I put that library into a, a video phone and a smartphone and, and allow that to every child, it will be magical. They can take their library home. They can play with it. The parents can get intrigued. There is a group session. A completely new level of awareness can come up. Wow, that's interesting, actually. That's, that's really, really interesting. Uh, Mr. Skruwana, what do you have to say about, it's also this time of the year, you know, when uh, colleges are now opening doors for a new batch of students to gain admission. It's a very hectic time, usually. It's stressful for the students, but it's also very buzzy for the college uh, campuses. What advice would you give to college and universities who are about to enroll their first batch of students who are living through this pandemic? Should they be doing something differently? You know, I think this is not about a situation because if you're starting a college right now, the question of you getting a job is three years later. And I don't think we're going to have the same challenges then. But I think each one has to introspect on their own learning. Now, if at a certain level, government and, you know, say the UGC and other people and the institutions themselves look at how curriculums need to be looked at, I think then a different kind of adaptation level. My personal sense is on that level, people are just looking at this as how do I get back to business and how do I get back to my normal versus what's the new normal. So unfortunately, I think that may not hold good for a lot of people. So if you were to kind of give a graduation speech at a college of a batch for 2020 that's graduating into a world where job insecurity is it's probably at its peak, what would you tell a graduating class of 2020? What would if your you're not, I would say a couple of things. I would say um, you're extremely, extremely fortunate that you're starting with a challenge instead of starting with a lollipop in your hand. Wow. And I would say to them very clearly that, that you're starting with a challenge and you're starting with hard times means you're going to learn some good lessons. You're going to learn some deep lessons and they're going to have much more better impact from you than if you just felt life was a breeze and you finished your graduation, you got a job and you got back into the world and then got into the entire grind and treadmill of doing that. So that will be my first thought for everyone and say, be privileged, hold your head high, don't get stressed about it. Second, now let's talk about the practicality. Now let's assume that all that is fine, Ronnie, but I don't have a job tomorrow and you're telling me to feel good about it. And I'm saying, yes, but that is something that you will then figure out. What do I need to do in my job or in my CD right now for me to look good? Because everyone will understand that 2020 was the COVID year. Right. Nobody's going to forget that in the world. You don't need to explain 2020 on your CV to anyone. Everyone will get that. So at that stage, pick up whatever experience you may want to do. Offer yourself as an intern free to somebody. Offer yourself to be in a, um, and do social work. I mean, imagine in 2020, if you said that I picked up work experience by giving back to society. That's the first thing I did. I first started not for profit before I started earning my salary. Can you imagine the premium you'll command in 2021 when you go out to find a job? That's that would be my um, two points at, at the 
at the graduation ceremony speech. Yeah, it's a, it, is a, it is a difficult speech to swing, but I think uh, the focus on actually giving back to the society is very, very critical. And that actually leads me to my next question. Uh, according to a KPMG reporting survey, Mr. Spruvalai, which was held in 2019, and these are staggering numbers, which compare state spending on CSR, Karnataka stood second in the table with the highest amount of money spent uh, towards CSR activities after Maharashtra. Uh, or I think it could be the other way around. I might have miswritten this. With some of the largest givers in India, like Narayan Murthy, Azim Premji, Nandan Nilinkani, Mohandas Pai, and you, uh, you know, as one of them, among many others coming out of the, these only two states, uh, what makes this statistic so skewed towards businesses based out of just these two states? I mean, why is, is not the art of giving the art of living? I mean, is this something which is really misunderstood? So, you know, in 2013, when, I, when we scaled up Aspadeh's foundation, uh, my wife Zari and I spent a fair amount, almost of a year, meeting about 400 NGOs. And what I would say is actually that the sweat equity is incredible across the board. There are a lot of people giving their time and energy. Not everything is cut with large checks. And I think today, when you look at, you know, the United States, and you can say, but they give 2% of their GDP towards CSR and this thing. Yeah, but half, more than half, I'd say 80% of that, goes to universities who anyway are so cash rich, they do treasury uh, investments in, in the stock market, okay? Or religious churches and things like that. And 20% maybe of that 2% goes to the real cause of what we want to do here. But very little sweat equity. But here, I think the sweat equity is a big asset. I think for most people, cutting a check has been something where you've not known where the money goes and there's not been that transparency, that clarity, that communication of what good people are doing. So then most people prefer to hold back rather than give and check it out. That's changing slowly. And, right. and I think the younger generation today is much more aware of having a balanced uh, life where you want to give back and you don't think you need to do that only after you've got a massive cash, a bank balance or you've retired. I think people are realizing that I want to give 10, 15% of my time, energy, and that's phenomenal. Right. Uh, sticking to this, um, I mean, sticking to your work that you do with the Swadesh Foundation, Mr. Struvala, India's GDP spend on healthcare is at a dismal 2 or 3% as compared to other developed countries like the US, you know, which stands at 11%. In the current times, this gap stares at our face, you know, yeah. quite closely. How can organizations like Swadesh help to fill some of these gaps in the rural, semi rural markets of India? Is healthcare something that's even in your radar? You know, the only way a private sector can do that now today uh, is, is really with technology when it comes to the not-for-profit. The for-profit, we don't have tertiary hospitals. We, we, you know, our statistics on hospitals, trained doctors and nurses is very alarming. But that's a 10-year bet. You can't take 10 years to fix that problem there. Yeah. Um, but I think, and a lot of that also stems from insurance. We're the most underinsured, health-insured country in the world or mostly I would say amongst most countries that would do them, maybe not the most. But that's also because even if I had an insurance, like if I wanted to give all our 1 million people that we work with in Raigarh and Maharashtra and said, okay, now you have a health insurance policy. But the point is, the question is, where do they go use it? Because there isn't a hospital in 40 kilometers. So even if they had a health insurance, they would still need to go all the way to, to Panvel or Mumbai to be able to take that. So I think that ecosystem is something that the government needs to get up on. Uh, and I think, you know, to a certain extent, we are yet tackling problems of poverty, we're tackling problems of house and whatever else. But I think medical and health is a huge, huge challenge. Sure. Uh, and, uh, you know, um, medical tech is not going to solve it at that bottom of the pyramid level. It'll so solve it at the top of the pyramid level. So I think it's a combination of a lot of PPP. Because I think if uh, public-private uh, partnerships take place for, for investments, and, you know, we should allow FDI here where people want to come in and build a whole chain of risk uh, of, uh, of, of hospitals. And we don't need 500 bed hospitals. We need a multiplicity of 50 bed hospitals. Sure. Sure. But we need three years and four years or five years in massive investment in training to train a very different level of people um, to be able to service that. 
what role do you think uh, data or big data as they call would have uh, to kind of map some of these dreams uh, facebook has recently invested in reliance geo and the focus is on data being the new oil i mean not the oil that plummeted a couple of weeks back but yes the oil of the future uh, yep. facebook has uh, also opened up facebook rooms as a counter to zoom uh, putting power back in the hands of the consumer by offering them more choice what does this race to get more data and more consumers mean for the future of work education how can we use this to us uh, meet some of these gaps uh, you know that had to do with healthcare or some of i mean what how does how can we use it's almost housekeeping and mandatory right now i mean i think data has now become you know it's like if i want to take a decision on something i do want the data point for it even if i want to give an increment to somebody i want a data point for it if i want to fire somebody i want to have the data point for it if i want to hire somebody on the data point from a business decision point of view data helps you with your final gut decision gut is not about just waking up and and taking a call because you felt good that morning gut is about um having all in front of you and then taking that final call and decision saying with everything in front of me the main thing on data is once one is that there is data the second way is how you look at it so the whole analytics of data and having the specialization of that is really where we need to take it to the next level because you can read data in multiple ways i can present anything that i want to do and if somebody is a smart communicator he'll present a story of a company in five different ways depending on whether he's talking to the investor and wants to raise money or his banker on which he wants to get a loan or is in or is or is um, uh, employees on which he doesn't want to pay them the highest salary so it will be all different stories but data will tell you something very different so that's why i think it's now almost a basic need for everything that we do but we need to know what we do with that data no that's actually quite true because um, metrics in any form and um, i mean metrics along with strategy can together help you achieve your goals and i don't think any one of them alone whether it's met metrics or just data or strategy and only strategy i don't think any one of them can uh, be as useful as both of them put together also kind of, uh, mr sruwala reflecting on an article that was published just this morning and i i don't know whether you've had a chance to go through it but it was published on cnn uh, where it spoke about how the most prolific film industry of the world which is bollywood has taken a complete hit because of the whole corona virus pandemic and obviously because of your uh, history with the with the whole movie industry as a producer uh, movie theaters have shut their doors production companies have called off shoots and film studios have delayed releases including the debuts of at least two major films that were expected to carry the season forward my question to you comes from the standpoint not only as a past producer but also a consumer how do you envision the future of both uh, of of the cinema industry uh, from both these standpoints you know there's a charm about movie making that you need to see on a big screen and that's that's not going to go away it's going to change you know 10 years back uh, seven or six out, out of the 10 people would go to a movie cinema already it's about 9 out of 10 people anyway watch it much later that one that audience and footfalls has been growing over a certain period of time so i think cinema watching in a theater is not going to go away it will yeah. have a setback for the next 18 months for sure i'm not saying 3 months it will be all of 18 months because i think okay. it's going to take its own challenge because if you don't have something where you feel you have a cure you're going to prioritize what you need to do you need to get to work you need to prioritize you need to meet your parents you need to do whatever else you need to do sure. but when it comes to crowds and all the recreational activities that's going to be in the lowest pecking order especially if you have a choice of having that same consumption in the safety not the privacy but the safety of your own home so i think for the next 18 months the behavioral pattern will be different post 18 months i'm not saying it can go straight back to normal i think there'll be a, a situation where a lot of people well i felt okay what i experienced here wasn't so bad so the nicotine that i had going to the cinemas will change to a certain extent um and therefore i think if somebody's gone to the movie theaters eight times a year probability is they might go four times a year and therefore content will have to be a lot more compelling sure. the good part about it also being on a home platform is your entire scripting and your entire storytelling takes a different point of view because the worst habit we have in india and i'm a, i'm a really bad uh complainer of this is the context of having an interval in the middle of a movie it's unheard of it's it, this is the only country in which it happens every country sells popcorn every one country sells samosas or whatever else they want to do only we have an interval so can you imagine that instead of flying from mumbai to delhi directly you're going to fly from mumbai to delhi via amdavad 
what happens? It's a much, much longer flight, right? Because 15 minutes before you reach Ahmedabad, you have to drop from 33,000 feet all the way down and then all the way take up. So when you're at an interval in a movie, you're already doing 15 to 20 minutes more of narration in a movie because you have to slow down the movie before the interval. Then you almost got to slightly recap it because people have stepped out and not done that. And the pace of the movie becomes more than a two hour movie. It becomes a two and a half hour movie. So storytelling in itself gets at this thing. The younger audience is now therefore getting a lot more uh, restless that I don't want to go out and have a three hour viewing experience on something between the ads and the interval and then stepping in and out. Uh, and it's less and less a social one. So I think those are the ones that may take a toll. But by and large, storytelling, you know, is, is magical. It will stay forever. Uh, pardon my ignorance, but I think a, a, a large part of why the interval actually is been interspersed with the whole movie watching experience is also because of the economics of the theater, right? Because Only in India, but not anywhere else in the world. Nobody else, nowhere else in the world do they have a cinema. Uh, they have a, they, before you start and then you pick it up and then you go. No, and, you know, Many people before used to have it just before a few ads. Just It was more a delay to get people to come in, sure. but not within a movie. Have wow. you ever seen a movie which has got an interval from a Hollywood movie? Never. It just cuts abruptly. Wow. Yeah, that's actually true. Never quite noticed it, but the next time yeah. we watch a yeah. movie... So, like, that, so yeah. that makes the entire viewing and storytelling habit differently. So when I'm doing it for a platform where I don't need to have it at home, where I don't need to have the interval, as much as in television, why is people looking at the platforms of today? It's not that the stories are that much better than television, but it's right. binge watching without commercials. Sure, sure. That makes actually a lot of sense. Uh, Mrs. Pruvala, in chapter 13 of your book, uh, Dream Your Own Dream, where you lay the foundation of what the next few decades of your life would have been about, the emphasis is on focus, choices and empathy. Given the time that we are in currently right now, if you were to give one piece of advice under each of these umbrellas to all of your people listening here and maybe countless more, uh, under focus, choice and empathy, what would that one piece of advice be? So I think from a focus point of view, I think the last eight weeks has only drawn me more and more closer to writing three things, which is a nameplate and sits of me in front of my desk, which is less for more. Yeah. And less for more. And I think... It's something that people will need to practice uh, because I think focus is comes about because we don't think that big. And when we do, we hit a glass ceiling very easily. And the minute we hit a glass ceiling, we don't think of smashing the glass ceiling. We then think of moving sideways. Focus yeah. allows us to really have that self-confidence, that self-conviction. And to me, therefore, less for more is an important communication from that. Choices is almost something that you will have to make individually. And the reason I would say that is because everyone thinks, oh, but I need a mentor. Nobody advised me about my choices. No, nobody's going to advise you about your choices. The best mentorship you can get is if somebody can ask you the hard questions that you didn't think of asking yourself. And it only helps you get your ability to make your best choices the better. And I think that's the most important part of making choices, asking yourself those hard questions and pausing and doing that. Um, when it comes to empathy, I believe that the future of this world is also going to be a lot more about being collaborative than being competitive. And therefore, to be collaborative, you need to have a sense of empathy. Now, empathy doesn't mean doing good to others, giving back to society. That's a given empathy. Empathy to your parents. I think it will bring people closer together and there's empathy in that. There's collaboration and there's empathy in that. And that's slightly contradictory because I also believe from a global order, countries are going to get a lot more nationalistic than global in many ways. They're going to almost, you know, look at it in a very sharp border-like manner. And I think that's going to be quite regretful, but it's going to be real over the next many, many years for a multiple of reasons. This only having triggered it. But I think empathy is going to be important, especially because maybe this, this time has forced people to understand what is important and what is not. And if you haven't spent that time to figure out what's important than not, don't wait for another extension of a lockdown. Figure it out now. No, with the number of memes that are coming out for another lockdown, we certainly hope that a lot of people have done all the introspection that they had to for a lifetime in these last few weeks. Um, also, just to kind of reflect a little bit on what Young Indians uh, uh, does. And, uh, you know, when, when I was kind of researching to ask you this question, I did realize, or I maybe have read, have, may, may have read somewhere that... Um, uh, 
the whole online education uh, platform that Upgrad provides is a bridge for uh, the have-nots in so many ways. Why I has started a new initiative uh, last year under accessibility uh, with about 2.1% of India's population suffering from some form of disability or the other. Uh, how do you feel a platform like Upgrad or what are the other things that uh, you know technology can do to kind of uh, reach out to them? And some, some you know, work from home, just work from home as a technology is going to be so phenomenal for um, mothers, for example, who just want to be with their kids or young mothers who feel they want to come back to work, but whatever else. So for the entire, and I don't mean to sound like it's going to be for one, one gender, but that gender does want to have a better choice, but now they can have that choice and give all they want because they can work from home. And I think the special is the less privileged in whatever form, physically handicapped, mentally handicapped, um, visually impaired, hearing impaired, sight impaired. I think that's going to make a big difference there. Um, so I think, you know, from our perspective, even when we're looking at it from an upgrad point of view, the online context was really that, that uh, it's a parallel it's a parallel time spent. You know, you don't have to give up to augment your lifelong learning. Lifelong learning is not an option anymore. Education is not an event anymore. It's not like, oh, I went to school, then I went to college. Those are events. Now it's no longer an event. Lifelong learning is something which is going to have to be with us, whether we like it or not. Otherwise, we're going to be definitely outdated for a multiple of reasons. And how do we do that without every time taking a break? And I think that's really what Upgrad brings to the table from that point of view. And I think technology and work from home today, I think is going to benefit a lot of large seg segments and sections of people and society. Right. No, I think, uh, I, I, th I think those are very valid points. And I think work from home, despite the fact that you did touch upon this at the beginning of this entire discussion, that we do live in joint families with our parents, with our cats, with our dogs, and at every a juncture, there's the doorbell ringing and somebody has to go open that doorbell. So efficiency is always, um, you know, uh, under some question, unlike the other, uh, uh, unlike other countries like the US, where the entire society is not used to living in the kind of way that we are living. So I think work from home for the Indian, for, for, for Indians would be very different from work from home for the rest yeah, of the yeah, But I would say the grass is not greener on the other side. I'd much rather have a nice family to be in yeah, than be in the US and be brutally alone. Yes, yes. Anyways, the US is not the place to be here, certain, certainly not after COVID. Uh, but uh, we are pretty much in the last, uh, uh, on the last question. So we will request every, anybody who has any questions, please drop those on the chat box and we will uh, take it up with Mr. Skruvala. Uh, I promised you, I will ask you your whole experience with Othello, uh, Mr. Skruvala, when you played the role of Othello when you were in school, you mentioned. Uh, tell us a little bit about your early years. I mean, now when you look at I think theatre, I have only fond memories of, whether it was Othello um, or whether it was Taming of the Shrew. I think from school to college, it was always a hobby. It was always a passion. You know, some people do, uh, you know, boxing or wrestling or gymnastics. And I think I chose elocution, debating and dramatics. Wonderful. But I think... Um, it just changes it for me. It gave me that self-confidence at a very early stage in my life that I really cherish. So my best memories are not the friendships, which were long lasting friendships that one makes because you're spending almost every evening rehearsing from 7 PM to 10 PM. And then weekends you're back again, performing for an audience and there's a different high, but those are all lovely memories. But what I cherish more than the memories is really the confidence that it gave me. Uh, at that very early stage in my life and the communication skills it gave me at that very early stage in life, which then develops your personality and everything percolates with that. Right. You know, I think people, people are not born smart. You need to get smart. But I think in the same way, communication skills, I do believe is an important one. And I feel really blessed with that. Right. Um, Mr. Skrubala, tell us just a kind of, if you want to, if you were to recap your, um, you know, some of your, maybe the top entrepreneurial decisions that you took, which kind of made you fearful, where you actually had to kind of, you were not sure of whether you had to kind of take this uh, decision or not. What would your top uh, decisions be that made you, in retrospect, of course, it's a winner, but it did scare you when you had to take that. No, I think when you're shutting something down, uh, you're confused. When you're starting something, you're confused. When you're changing tracks, you're confused. When you're moving from a B2B model to a B2C model, you're confused. Um, you know, um, so I think in, in most elements, there is no top and there's no bottom at that point in time, 
it may sound like the most important decision you're making. And then six months later or three months later, it is not. So I don't have a ranking for these kind of things because I believe it's at that particular point in time. And those were not less important decisions that I make that right. than the importance that one made now. Because if I didn't make those then, I wouldn't be where I am today to make the decisions I can make oh. them now. Sure, that actually is quite true. Um, we do have some questions coming in, Mr. Skruwala. We're going to take one from Dr. Kaushik Murali. Um, uh, Dr. Murali is actually an ophthalmologist and he runs an eye hospital from Bengaluru. Uh, and he's asking you, uh, with so many free materials from most eminent colleges and thought leaders, how can an entrepreneur in this space make money? Is there a quality check on content in this space? Yes, I mean, Upgrad is, is charging. It's not, uh, you know, and I know you said it's not it's for the have nots, but I think not at all because I think we are charging the right amount of money because education is not something that you can just sit in front of and become and consume content. So um, I get uh, it is a tough element of, of, of um, if you're in the content business to, to do it only on a subscription model, but it's the only way to go because advertising is going to go up and down and it'll be comparative. If you don't want to feel that in the beginning um, you want to be on the platform side and the monetization side, then stay in the creative side and create the vision that you want to create and give it to somebody else and you'll at least have a business model there on a creation side. But if you also want to monetize it, yes, it's a challenge because in India we just haven't learned to be able to pay for content as we go forward. Right, right. I think that's very, very critical. But I do feel Yeah, and I think the businesses of today happens everywhere else. I mean, I think, you know, everyone started eating out because you had two or three insanely funded food delivery companies that gave discounts and almost forced you to eat at a discount because it was like, you know, Maka Khana is also not good enough because I'm getting it free now. Why would I get anything else? And now when these discounts stop, let's see how it works. Yeah, I, I mean... The, it, it, is a, it is a very, uh, it, it is a tightrope walk, Mr. Skruvala, because, you know, as you rightly said, people are not used to paying for content, you know, and I think, but I do feel that in the last uh, 8 to 10, 12 weeks, I think that this will have, this would have changed the mindset of a lot of us uh, going forward. Um, we do our... My sense is 8 weeks and 12 weeks don't change mindsets, but I think a year will change it. Well, I, I'm speaking uh, from the uh, experience of being a mother of two extremely uh, changed human beings, uh, young but changed human beings in the last eight weeks. So uh, pardon my limited understanding on this. But right. uh, Ruala, thank you so much for your Thank time. you. And uh, this has been a fantastic conversation. I do hope we see more of you in the whole YI ecosystem. So uh, do keep uh, coming back and we will keep inviting you and uh, sharing your yeah. interests. Thank you. I really enjoyed this and thank you for taking the trouble. I think all your questions are very poignant and a lot of homework and thank you. <laughs> no, no, no. Thank you. I am going to invite uh, Sandeep Prati, who's the co-chair uh, of uh, the learning team from YI. Sandeep, if you could kind of just give a vote of thanks to Mr. Skruwala before we can allow him to... That's the only thing not allowed in the digital hemisphere because then you suddenly find the head count of everyone going and running away. So I think vote of thanks is now passe for, uh, for digital webinars is what I would recommend. But go ahead, please. Okay, allow us to give it this time and then yes, 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 yes. <laughs> I'm recommending to you for your future ones. But yeah, okay, go got that. Thank you. Thank you, Yashudra. Uh, it's my privilege to give you a word of thanks, Mr. Ronnie Skruwala. Like last week, I started reading your book, Dream with Your Eyes Open, an entrepreneurial journey. And listening to your life today, it's an event to remember for a lifetime. Thank you. From a Thank modest you. beginning in Mumbai's Grand Road to first generation entrepreneur, you make us believe that when you set your mind and heart to something, anything is possible. As we all are going through this tough phase of life, rebuilding work life in a post-COVID world looks difficult, but it's possible. Few of the learning takeaways from this session is importance of communication in business organization, Introspect on your own learnings. You have rightly said that learning by growing should be our mool mantra. As an entrepreneur, you need to see the big picture faster, find new opportunities, and take decisions quickly. Focus allows us to create self-confidence and asking yourself the hard questions. Thank you so much. On behalf you. of AI Young Indians, thank I would you. like to thank you, Mr. Skruwala. Thank you. And Sandeep, I have one question before you go. Why is there not an Indian flag behind you and why is there an American flag behind you? 
have an Indian flag too. <laughs> okay, okay, because but it's not as large as the other one, so you know <laughs> it's okay. It's just an observation. Thank you very much. Thanks for your kind. Words. Thank you for sharing your experience and perspective on issue we all face as we live our dreams. I would Thank like you. to conclude that you have inspired all young Indians to dream big. Dream big with your eyes open. Thank you. Jai Hind. Thank you. Thank you very much. Bye, everyone. Thank you. Bye. Bye.